and we're talking about uh, ancient Egypt. Mm. How far back do you think that goes? Oh, I think uh, the the Nile goes back a very, very, very long way. The Nile, the the Nile River system, twelve, twelve and a half thousand years ago, looked looked much the same as it as it does today. Actually, Africa suffered much less from sea level rise than many other continents. The place that the place that was most dramatically affected by sea level rise was around Indonesia and Malaysia. Geologists call it the Sunda Shelf. Um, and again, it shows up on ancient maps as it looked during the Ice Age, not, not as it looks today. There was a, a continent-sized landmass that went underwater there. If, 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 if your continental shelves are very shallow, and uh, very, very, very limited and very deep, then you don't lose a lot of land. But if they're, if they're slow and gradual, you, you lose a great deal of land. Africa didn't suffer so much. The Nile River system was pretty much 12 and a half thousand years ago the way that it is today. The big difference was that the Sahara Desert uh, was uh, was 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 green and fertile. At and that this time. is this coincides with uh, Dr. Robert Schock's absolutely assertion that we're when you look at the Temple of the Sphinx, you're dealing with thousands of years of water erosion. Yes, yes. And the last time there was water like that in the Nile Valley was when. The last time you had the water erosion like that in the Nile Valley was precisely during the Younger Dryas. The Younger Dryas was a period of extremely heavy rains in Africa. And it's rainfall, it's, it's erosion caused by heavy rains that is the enigma on the Great Sphinx. It's not, we're not saying that there was a flood came over the Great Sphinx. What, what Robert Schock is saying and what his evidence clearly demonstrates is that we're looking at what's called precipitation-induced weathering. Weathering that was caused by exposure to about a thousand years of extremely heavy rainfall. And Dr. Robert Schock puts that thousand years precisely in the Younger Dryas period. That's the last time that rains of that magnitude fell on Egypt. And it's why we cannot sensibly accept the insistence of Egyptologists that the Sphinx is just four and a half thousand years old. By all means, yes, 2,500 BC, the ancient Egyptians were there, but I believe they found the Sphinx already created and already heavily eroded, and that they then recarved its head into the head of a pharaoh. And that head, as Robert Schock and others have pointed out, um, is uh, way too small in relation to the body. That makes sense if it was a heavily eroded lion head, which was then later cut down into the head of a pharaoh. The geology speaks to the original Sphinx being more than 12,000 years old. And that's the funny thing, because when, the, when, when Robert Schock, and, and let's not forget John Anthony West. John Anthony West, and I know you had him on his show before yes. he passed. John Anthony West was the first person to suggest that there should be a huge question mark over the Sphinx, that the erosion patterns on the Sphinx suggest it was much older than Egyptologists said, and, and maybe 12,000 years old. And at that time, uh, the response of Egyptology was, oh, rubbish. The Sphinx can't possibly be 12,000 years old because there's no other megalithic monument anywhere in the world that's anywhere like 12,000 years old. Well, that got blown out of the water completely, forever, by the discovery of Gobekli Tepe in Turkey, which isn't even that far from Egypt. Gobekli Tepe, 11,600 years old, a giant megalithic site. My goodness, if you can make Gobekli Tepe, you can make the Sphinx. It adds hugely to the credibility of Robert Schock's argument. And I want to pay tribute to Robert Schock because there's a mainstream academic who's been willing to stick his neck out despite taking all sorts of slings and arrows from his colleagues, he sticks with the data. And what the data says, regardless of what Egyptologists say, is that the Sphinx is 12,000 plus years old. And Jamie, can you pull up some of the images of that? Because it is really compelling. When you look at the water erosion evidence that is all around the Temple of the Sphinx, it's, it's really fascinating stuff, even for someone who doesn't know much about erosion. Hmm. But when you, when you look at it through his descriptions and his understanding of the, the various levels of stone, how some of it is harder, and this is the reason why yeah. some of it is eroded less. You see it, you see it most clearly in the, in the trench surrounding the Sphinx. You see it there. Right. Uh, those, those deep vertical fissures are classic precipitation-induced weathering, classic weathering produced by rainfall pouring over the edge of that. You don't see it so much on the body of the Sphinx for a very specific reason, that the body of the Sphinx has been repeatedly restored. Some of those blocks that we're looking at there were actually put in place during the Old Kingdom, when the Sphinx is supposed to have been made from, from new. What were they doing restoring the Sphinx 4,500 years ago if they'd just built it? 
You know, logic needs to be applied to this whole process, and we need to free ourselves from the dogma uh, of of the academic mainstream. And so, so if this was all, if this water erosion began thousands and thousands of years ago, uh, thousands and thousands of years earlier than conventional Egyptologists date this era, how old do you think that actual civilization was? Like, how far back? I think it. I think it could go back twenty thousand years before that. Uh, I think it was around all that time, and again, this is a point that I think needs to be made. Um, archaeologists will tell you that the entire population of the Earth were hunter-gatherers during the Ice Age, say 20,000 years ago, at the peak of the last Ice Age. Everybody was hunter-gatherers, according to archaeologists. But we today live in a world where an advanced civilization, our own, if we dare call ourselves advanced, and in some ways I think we're not advanced at all, coexists with hunter-gatherers. There are hunter-gatherers in the Amazon rainforest. Some of them don't even know we exist. They've been spotted from aerial surveys. Hunter-gatherers in the Namibian desert. The notion that different types of civilization can coexist on the same planet shouldn't be surprising to us, because we do it. And that's what I'm suggesting was the case back then but a civilization very different from our own. They certainly had technology, enough technology to explore the Earth, enough technology to map the Earth. There's an amazing book, um, which I may have mentioned to you before, Joe, a book, a book called Hamlet's Mill. And it was written by two professors of the history of science, Giorgio de Santillana and Hertha von Deschen, back in the 60s. And what that book is dynamite, because it shows, going back into the oldest myths and traditions of the world, highly advanced astronomical knowledge, an astronomical knowledge that should not have been possessed by hunter-gatherer civilizations, astronomical knowledge that could only have been accumulated through thousands of years of careful observation and recording of data. That astronomical knowledge is present in the most ancient myths of mankind. And in fact, it was that book, Hamlet's Mill, just as much as my first experience in front of the Great Pyramid that led me to begin asking questions about the narrative of our past. And I think it's healthy that we should have an alternative narrative. And I can't understand why archaeology is so, I have to say, so afraid of alternative narratives.